am so glad that you are here today. You uh, are one of the greatest women thought leaders in the world, and boy, do we need more of those. Um, I'm going to begin right now uh, by telling you something that you probably already know. We have 113,000 deaths in our country from COVID-19. 40 million of us have lost our jobs or closed our businesses. And the effects of racial injustice are erupting all across our nation. It is very difficult to be an optimist at this time. Why is optimism so important during these times, Margaret? And how do we cultivate it in our lives? Well, thank you very much for making me so welcome. Thank you for inviting me to, to share this event with you. And, and um, thank you to everybody for joining. Um, Optimism is important for a number of reasons, um, not least of which is that optimistic people tend to do better in life than pessimists. But that isn't because they go through life with sort of rose-tinted glasses, just imagining everything's going to be fine. Uh, optimists tend to be people who take action. They believe that they understand when bad things happen that they are bad, but they don't think that they're forever and they don't think that they're hopeless. So they tend to be people who take action. They tend to be people who think quite carefully about what the action may, might be. And they're generally aware that even if things are bad in one place, they may be better somewhere else. And so there are always opportunities for learning. So I think, you know, the, I completely agree. It is a very, very difficult moment to be optimistic. And as an American born and bred, I feel that very intensely right now. But I also know um, that we have been through terrible times in the past and come out of them with some degrees of progress. And I also have to say, at the risk of sounding rather sentimental, that America, in my experience, and having worked in many places in the world, as an astounding concentration of unbelievably creative, constructive, positive, optimistic people. And that optimism in itself, I think, is really a national asset. Now, that isn't to say that we just have to believe everything will be fine and it will be fine. It will only be fine if our belief prompts action. In terms of action, I'd like to talk about courage. You mm. say that 85% of us know there is a problem, whether it's in our workplace or our community, and that 85% of us don't say anything or take any action. It's the 15% who have the courage to speak up or to do something. Are those 15% just extraordinary human beings? Well, it's a very great question, actually. So I first encountered this data when I was writing my book, Rule for Blindness, which looks at individuals and organizations that often persist in not seeing a problem or an opportunity that really stares them in the face. And so there are you know, many recent examples of this. Uh, the Wells Fargo uh, mis-selling crisis was one of those. The Volkswagen emissions scandal was one of those. The whole of the banking crisis was one of those. The Catholic, uh, scan uh, scandals in the Catholic Church, and so on and so forth. And these, all of these events and scandals have exactly the same pattern, which is um, something terrible goes wrong. And the first thing is nobody could have seen this coming. And then it turns out one or two people saw it coming. And then it turns out that actually scads of people saw the problem. And by and large, nobody did anything about it. But you, there's also a phenomenon where when you keep looking a bit deeper, you see there are some people who tried. And so I became very interested in those people because I thought, well, if we could understand who they are and what they are, we might try to find more of them. Um, and so I did a huge amount of research into this area. And what I discovered is not that they are exceptional people. So I guess I thought if I could come up with a profile, maybe they're all really tall or they're all redheads, you know, 
or um, you know, there are lots of myths around these people. One is that they're primarily women, which they aren't. Another is that they're pri primarily people of faith, which they aren't. And the really interesting, and I think optimistic finding is that these people are pretty ordinary. Hmm. So what that suggests is that, is that there could be more of them. So one of the people that I interviewed was Sharon Watkins, who was you know, the, the person within Enron, who wrote to the chairman to say, we have a gigantic financial accounting problem here. And she did that like a typical optimist because she thought if we know about it, we can fix it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and sadly what she discovered, she discovered too late. And also it was actually, it's kind of strange. It was actually such a gigantically convoluted financial system that they'd engineered it and wrong that even on the day they went bankrupt, it turns out they actually weren't bankrupt. It's just nobody could understand the accounting well enough to see what they actually possessed. Um, but when I asked her, why of all the people in Enron, many of whom could see that things were being done in a very weird way, why you? And she said, you know, she had been one of three people on the cover of Time magazine that year, along with um, a whistleblower at the FBI and a whistleblower at WorldCom. And when they got together and talked, you know, they couldn't find anything they had in common except one thing. And the one thing they had in common was they all grew up in small towns with populations of under 10,000 people. And she said, in those smaller communities, you become very self-sufficient and you know that if something's going wrong, like a telephone pole is down or, um, you know, there's a water, a water main leak somewhere, it does not occur to you to walk on by. You phone the fire department or the water department or whatever. You do something about it. And you do something about it because it's your town. And I remember presenting this at a conference of CEOs and, and one of them kind of jumped up, a sort of epiphany. And she said, so actually we, we need to run our companies like communities where people feel it's their company. And many business writers talk about that uh, this is wanting to have a workforce where people think like owners. And so I don't think it's that these are people who have exceptional courage. I think they're simply people who feel an exceptional level of responsibility or ownership. And I think in the right circumstances and in the right culture, excuse me, this could be any of us. And the other thing I would say is that there are very often, we hear about the scandals because they all blow up eventually. But what we never hear about are the companies where things have gone wrong and people stand up and say, actually, we have a real problem here. And as a consequence of that, the problem gets fixed. And we never hear that story for two reasons. A is it's kind of dull. Right. And the second is because the company doesn't want to admit they had the problem in the first place, especially once it's fixed, it's not a problem anymore. But I sort of think we should tell these stories more often because they give people courage and they give people confidence that standing up and calling it as they find it can have a positive outcome. And because I mentor a lot of senior leaders and chief executives, I hear these stories quite a lot, but I wish people would learn to tell them with more pride, because there is no organization where nothing ever goes wrong. So the real issue is, do you have a culture where people feel it's safe enough to speak up and a culture that's open enough to criticism that people can hear it and act on it rather than trying to bury it? Thank you so very much for that. Um, Margaret, we are witnessing some amazing results from women leaders on the world stage during this pandemic. And I was reading that I think there are five of them who have led their countries with remarkable results. Uh, yet there are still too few women leaders in our countries and companies. What impedes our progress and how do we fix it? Hmm. It's a great and very, very difficult problem. Um, 
What impedes our progress, I think, is a number of things. I think one is, in many places, a viciously competitive um, political process in government, and often a very, quite a lot of very viciously competitive corporate cultures, which are pretty unappealing to women, and where the message that they hear is, if you put your, above, your head above the parapet, we'll shoot it off. And many women looking at that and looking at the kinds of exceptionally aggressive and destructive behaviors that it provokes, just walk away and think, I, I would rather do something else in a different way that is consonant with my values. But I think the other reason is that we haven't made enough progress forging alliances between women who want to progress and men who want them to progress. And I'm quite often asked to speak at conference, you know, women's conferences. And, and I like doing it because I just love the company of smart women, you know, I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> but I often think we're preaching to the converted when we actually need to be having a much more straightforward conversation with men about the privilege that they enjoy, which to many of them remains invisible, the consequences of that for their society, their families, and their daughters, and the degree to which we need to make common cause. Because I'm, I'm pretty confident that we are not going to make the headway we need to make until we support men and they support us. I could not have done what I do in my life had I not had the support, active encouragement, and active parenting of my husband. We have a partnership where we don't think that the success of one mitigates against the success of the other. And so I think somehow we have to have a better dialogue on that topic. I also think that we have been a little disingenuous, and this is a little controversial, but I'll say it anyway which is we've li we like to say, and I have said this in the past, that a rising tide lifts all boats and that if women do better, everybody does better. And I think that's absolutely true in the long term. In the short term, the fact is that if women are gonna get board seats and C-suite positions, from a male perspective, that means there are fewer of those opportunity for men. That's just the truth of it. And I think we need to acknowledge that and we need to honor the men who say, right, it's my turn to make way for a woman. Because if we can honor that sacrifice, it's more honest, it's appropriate, and that's how we'll get to a world which is ultimately better for everyone. But I think it's a nursery rhyme or a fairy tale that you can make really significant change without anybody having to cede any ground. I just don't understand how that works. Yes, very good point. I agree with that. It, it brings up something that's up in our conference every year. We are criticized for having men open our conference or to participate mm. and uh, we've had talks about that about how we need to bring men into this realm so i yeah. agree with you thank you for that i mean i'm very proud that my my son is a huge champion of the women that he works with um and i also have to say one of the greatest champions for women in the workplace ever in the history of American business um, is Ted Childs, an African-American man who decided to, you know, invest all of his kind of career professional capital in the advancement of women at IBM. And IBM was an absolute leader in this space for decades because of Ted's influence. And honestly, I think I owe my understanding to the need for that alliance very much to Ted, who was absolutely inspirational to me and to thousands of other women. Thank you. 
Margaret, each day our governor, like so many other governors, releases statistics and projections. Our very lives and the way in which we begin to return to work are based upon these statistics and projections. In your new book, you make a very compelling case that the great evidence of predictions and forecasts are misguided efforts to find certainty in an uncertain world. How do we best live and work in this uncertainty? Yeah. Well, I think it's really important to recognize that um, we can make forecasts. And in something like the COVID crisis, I think we have, there's a responsibility to tell the public where we are from day to day. But I wish that these predictions and forecasts were preceded by more of a kind of health warning, which is these are estimates. They are based on models. Models are never complete. They never have all the data and they're working against historical models, which may be out of date. And so their estimates, which we can assign probabilities to, just like a weather forecast, right? So a, a weather forecast will say, you know, there's an 85% chance of rain. That doesn't mean it's gonna rain and it doesn't mean it isn't going to. It means it's more likely it will rain than that it won't. And the same is true in the pandemic, which is we have forecasts of where we are in the curve, where we are in the cycle, but there is a huge amount of uncertainty that surrounds those numbers. In addition, I think it's been very interesting the way that people have, have started talking about the science. The science says this, or the science says that. You know, I live with a scientist. And one of the things I've learned from living with a scientist is there is no such thing as the science. Science is a process and it reveals understanding, but it's an active and dynamic process. And what we understand about today is more than we understood yesterday about today. We will understand more about today, tomorrow, a month from now, a year from now, maybe 10 years from now when all the data is crunched. So this is a developing story and there is no absolute certainty to be found within it. And in our expectation of certainty, I think we force people often into kind of over promising when we would do better to say, we think this is kind of roughly where we are. This is how we're making our decisions which you know, one hopes is kind of rational and explainable. And this is what we hope to see. But every decision that a, a political leader or a healthcare professional is making right now, every one of those decisions is a hypothesis. And we're all learning as we go along. And I don't think they should overpromise. And I don't think it's phenomenally productive for us to beat them up if they're not right, as long as they can explain how they made the decisions, and that seems a rational process. Margaret, you were among uh, one of the first women CEOs in the United States, and I was thinking about that when I heard management consultant Tom Peters. He said that all of our legacies are be being created during this time, and it's how we behave and interact with others. It's how we will be remembered. You've referred to the necessity of becoming more human. If you were a CEO right now, leading a company, what would you be doing? Hmm. Well, you know, I doff my hat to Tom Peters, who was a huge champion of mine and has been a champion for women, you know, since way before it was fashionable. Um, I would be doing what many, female, what many female CEOs are doing to this day. Um, and I mentor a couple of them. They are in constant contact with their workforce, with their direct reports, with many, many people across the company. They are in contact with their suppliers, recognizing that they may be going through really tough times too. 
They are in constant contact with their customers, recognizing that they may also be going through a really tough time. So they are simply brilliantly over communicating, which is exactly what you have to do in a crisis. And they're doing so, as you would expect, with a high degree of empathy. In other words, they are not reading from a script that the comms department produced for them. They're doing it with a real heartfelt understanding of the difficulty that many, many people are going through. And they're really paying attention to the domestic situation in which many people are trying to hang on to their jobs. So they're aware of you know, who's trying to do homeschooling while also doing their work that kind of thing. So they're really paying attention to their people as individuals and not just sort of blasting generalized newsletters out to them without really taking the pulse of individuals. Most of the CEOs I know make it a point to talk to a certain number of people directly on the phone every day. Uh, some of them are setting up um, kind of virtual, uh, a virtual coffee shop. Some of them are doing virtual office hours. Here in the UK, some are doing virtual pubs where you can bring your own glass of wine or, or a pint of beer and come and just chat about almost anything except business. They're being phenomenally uh, creative in the things that they're thinking about. I mean, also I would say there's a tech company that I've been talking to recently run by two guys and um, the first thing they did was check with every single one of their employees, what was their tech set up and what did they, did they need? Did they need a better screen if they were going to be online all day long? Um, did they have you know, decent kind of office furniture, ergonomic chairs so they wouldn't be coming back to work with RSI? And they provided people with um, a kind of lump sum of money for office furniture because lots of people didn't have that in their offices. And also, interestingly, I think, um, a certain set of money for exercise equipment so that they could go running or skip rope or, I don't know, whatever else they wanted to do with an emphasis on really keeping physically well, as well as um, being able to do the work. So these are really thoughtful people who understand that all the technology and machinery that we introduce into our businesses is completely generic. And that what makes each of our companies distinctive is the people who work there. Very good point. Um, Margaret, most people avoid conflict. We're uncomfortable in its midst, but you give compelling arguments that good disagreement is central to our progress. How do we most effectively dare to disagree? Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful question. You know, referring back to the, the, state, the statistic you quoted before about 85% of people will typically stay silent when they know that something's going wrong. Um, there are really two reasons, the two main reasons that are given for this. And the first is fear of retribution from my supervisor or my coworkers. And the second reason is futility. I could speak up, but it wouldn't make any difference. So the first of those really grabbed my attention because I thought if there's a fear, then there's also underneath that, I think, a lack of confidence in one's ability to have a civil conversation about the problem. And when I talk to people who are caught in this trap, um, generally, they felt they had only two options. The first option was stand on the tabletop and scream about it, and the other one was shut up. And what they didn't seem to appreciate is that between those two options, there's a whole spectrum of possibilities. And so, and I teach this now um, at the university where I'm a professor, um, which is I teach this fantastic curriculum de designed by an American academic named Mary Gentili called Giving Voice to Values, which it really walks people through. If you have a concern, how do you bring it up in a way that the person you're talking to doesn't feel attacked, doesn't feel threatened, doesn't feel humiliated, but might be prepared to listen and might be prepared to act on your concern. And this, I think, is rapidly becoming an absolutely fundamental
business skill. How not just to be a pleaser at work and do all the stuff you're supposed to do, but how to raise the really awkward topics. And there are two reasons for this. One, obviously, is because otherwise these terrible things, what the problems like Volkswagen emissions would just grow and grow and grow. But the other thing is that I learned is that often women in particular are fantastically good at spotting new business opportunities. And they can see that there are some things that it's just right to do right now. They have a tremendous sense of zeitgeist. And so if they don't speak up about that, then they become very frustrated again, of course. But of course the company loses gigantic amounts of value. And one of the you know, absolutely best entrepreneurs I ever met like this was a brilliant woman in Ohio named Carol Latham. And Carol realized in the 80s that the whole world of personal computing was exploding. And she asked herself a brilliant question, which is, if this is a huge trend, what might slow it down? And she realized it was heat that computers get hot as processing power increases. So she had this great idea. She is a chemist by training. If I could invent a material to take the heat away, then, um, then that would allow this tremendous new technology to advance. And she went to her bosses and said, I've had this great idea. And of course, they just looked at her and they thought she's crazy. So we're not in the computing business. And what do you know about computing anyway? And they sent her on a couple of courses, you know, to kind of make her feel good. And of course, she did what lots of women do. You know, she stormed off in a half and thought, you guys are useless. I'll set up my own business. And she did set up her own business. And, you know, the truth of the matter is there's a little bit of Carol Latham inside everybody's laptop today. A gigantic, really important business which her own bosses wouldn't listen to. But I think, you know, the moral of the story is that in companies, it's crucial to speak up because either the, the lurking danger or the failure to seize really hot opportunities, these are fundamental to the sustainability of the business. And so you need both bosses who are prepared to listen and a workforce that's prepared to speak up. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're getting questions and I encourage you to continue to send them in and we'll take a break in a moment and turn to that. You made this reference to Tom Lipte in your book that I found this mm. fascinating uh, when you were discussing predictions and forecasts. Mm. And he now is the most accurate forecaster in the world. Yet when I researched him, he's quite humble, and he mostly talks about his misses and errors, uh, which I, I found just so ironic. Is that the key to his success, and what can we learn from all of this? His humility is definitely part of the key to his success. Um, he worked with an academic named Philip Tetlock, and Philip Tetlock ran something called the Good Judgment Project. And it pitted teams of forecasters against each other, uh, one from MIT and one, I think, from the University of Michigan. And, um, and you know, to cut a long story short, Tetlock's team just kept winning. So what was he doing that was so extraordinary? The people that he recruited were not, you know, kind of IQs of a million. They were people who were quite humble, who kept thinking, you know, I could be missing something. I should do a bit more reading or dig a bit more deeply or maybe read more broadly. And they were also people who kept challenging their own forecasts about, you know, what might I have overlooked? And also with every single forecast, they would compare what they had predicted to what happened and kind of keep track of their own accuracy rates, which is absolutely fundamental if you want to become good at this. But what Tetlock and the Good Judgment Project found is that nobody is ever always right. And in particular, when you're thinking of the uses of forecasting in business, what many people who do forecasting, for example, about the tech industry said, if, if you're always very accurate, 
then you're actually not trying hard enough because actually the forecast that says the thing is blindingly obvious, it's really easy to get those ones right. But the interesting forecasts are the ones that are a little more obscure, a little harder to see. And if you're willing to take better bets, you learn more about your own forecasting ability. And, and forecasts really should never be used as the sole basis of decision making. They should be used as a basis for discussion and debate around what the options are. So if we believe this forecast is true, what should we be doing right now? So I think, um, you know, the, the other thing, of course, that Tetlock found, which is fantastic and, and made a lot of headlines, is actually the more famous the forecasters, the more likely they are to be wrong. And what Tetlock argued was that they kind of fall in love with their grand theories of everything and then get stuck because that's what they stand for and their thinking doesn't change. And I think the really great forecasters do not have these grand theories of everything. They remain open-minded all the time. And I think humility is really at the basis of that. At every moment, they keep thinking, I could be wrong and I may have missed something, so I need to keep looking. Interesting. Um, Margaret, you said in your books and in some of the TED Talks that I watched that in uncertain, in uncertain times, asking what if can help us become resilient. Can you give us some examples of what if thinking? Sure. Um, probably the most famous example of what if thinking came out of the Shell Scenario planning unit in the 1970s. Shell was very ahead of its time in terms of developing a process for scenario planning. And what this did was it brought together hard data and soft data. So it pulled planning away from purely financial function uh, to draw scenarios of possible futures. So it all had to be based on real evidence that was reliable and plausible. And one of the scenarios that they constructed was what would happen if the oil price fell. And at the time, everybody laughed at them saying, well, this is just stupid. It's a natural resource and it's in limited supply. So the laws of supply and demand argue that it will only ever go up in price. And the Shell people said, well, maybe you're right, but you know, the whole point of scenario planning is to ask what if, so we're gonna ask what if. And they said, well, actually, if the, if the oil price fell, then we would be in a bad position if we were holding really great reserves for which you'd overpaid. We would be in a bad position if we had gigantic fixed costs. We would be in a bad position if um, we didn't have other sources of revenue and so on and so forth. And when they looked at those, they said, well, you know, that implies all kinds of things that we could be doing anyway to make our business more resilient. So whether or not the oil price falls, let's just do that stuff anyway, because it makes good business sense. Of course, when two years later, the oil price fell, Shell was in, a, in the cat bird seat because none of its competitors had even dared to think this way. Um, there's another long example in my book about the government of Slovenia, who basically said, you know, we they had a very interesting problem, which was that economically the country was doing very much better year after year, but people were not getting any happier. And the sign of their unhappiness was disenfranchisement. They had the lowest rate of electoral participation in Europe. And so they said, well, what if we asked a very broad cross section of citizens what we should do about this? So instead of us doing the typical party political thing of coming up with things we think people want, why don't we ask them to tell us what they want? And the consequence of this, which was a really extraordinary two year project, was that the nation really handed their government a kind of wish list against which the government put a budget and started to implement. So it kind of turned a lot of the, the kind of moribund, rather stale and party political democratic processes into something very, very much more dynamic and open and transparent and legitimate. So it was a very outstanding example uh, experiment 
in democracy, which would not have happened had they not asked, well, what if we did things differently this, this time? Because it hasn't been working too well recently. Thank you. Um, this really hit home with me. You state in your book that the more we let technology think for us and act for us, the less that we will be able to make a future for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And in one particular example, we have parenting apps. We have an app for our everyday lives, for our work. And more and more, we rely upon this technology. Um, tell us about that, Margaret, and what impact you think it's having on us and our lives. Sure. Well, the parenting app is really a, a catastrophe um, because what they found with it was that, you know, the more people used it, the more time they spent staring at their phones and the less time they spent actually engaging with their children. Um, I mean, the intellectual underpinning of the app was completely flaky, but the real problem was that the app actually tried to condition the parent to behave in a certain way and thereby kind of cutting the parent off from the experience of parenting. So it's a rather beautiful example of what I call the automation paradox, which is essentially if you outsource something to technology, you lose the experience and the skill. And you may think you're getting you know, something better <laughs> as a res in exchange, um, but whether it is actually better, I think is, is often debatable. Um, I think, you know, so I think there is a, a fundamental issue, which is there is this trade-off. If I outsource something to technology, I'm going to lose the capacity to do it myself. Now, in some respects, I might not mind that. So I have effectively outsourced to my phone the collection of phone numbers. And I would say, you know, when I was much younger, I probably knew the phone numbers by heart of my 20 closest friends and family members. I don't know their phone numbers anymore. I have outsourced that to my phone. And if I didn't have my phone, I could not call them up. I'm kind of okay with that. Um, am I okay with outsourcing my parenting to an app? I'm definitely not okay with that. Am I okay with letting an app listen to everything I do and collect everything I uh, collect data on everything I do to do with what it wants? Definitely not. Would I be okay with a piece of technology choosing my next job? Definitely not. Choosing the, my insurance policy? Definitely not. Choosing the hotel where I'm going to stay if I ever get to go on vacation again? Definitely not. So I think, you know, what we have to understand is the more we use this stuff, the more we lose the capacity for our own critical thinking. And you can see this physiologically, which is the more you use GPS, the more the parts of your brain responsible for spatial awareness shrink. Mm -hmm. So I think what this argues is we need to be very, very much more thoughtful and choiceful and vigilant about where technology takes from us a capability we might not care about very much and where it threatens to take something from us that we care about a lot and i'm you know just a one example i'm uncomfortable with kids growing up with um home speakers that they can shout at i'm uncomfortable with them learning to talk to a machine and as if it were a person in a way that's kind of rude, aggressive, and thoughtless. Because that's learning an exceptionally bad form of communication. Great. Margaret, thank you so much. And Deb, thank you so much. Welcome. This was so interesting. We're gonna move on to Q&A. There's a bunch of questions from attendees. So we have about 15 minutes, and I'm gonna start off with a question from an attendee named Lucia. She asked, how do we talk to men about why they should support women, even if that means there'll be less opportunities for men in the near term? Yeah, 
So fantastic question. So I think there are a couple of things. The first thing I would say is I once um, did a, did some work with um, the heads of an organization that brought together all the heads of the big supermarkets. And um, perhaps not surprisingly, they had very, 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 very few women in their leadership levels. Um, although the vast proportion of its wor their workforce were female. And I drew a kind of diagram of where women were within their organizations. And the truth is they were all at the bottom of the pyramid. And I, you know, I showed that as a slide and simply asked the question, so this is the industry you work in. Um, would you be really happy encouraging your daughter to go into an industry that looked like this? Hmm. Interesting. There was a kind of stunned silence. Right. So one of the things we find is that senior leaders get really excited about diversity pretty much at the moment that their daughters start to graduate from college and they start understanding the problem from a personal level. Um, so that's one of the things I would say. I would say something else, which is a little more challenging, but, you know, generally speaking, you know, senior leaders in, engage me to challenge them and they get what they pay for. <laughs> um, which is, you say that your company serves society. You all have these statements, mission statements about how you want to make the world a better place and provide the world with great products and services. So half of that, more than half of that society that you are serving is female. So tell me how you're helping that majority of the population. If they aren't represented seriously at all levels of your organization, at what point can you claim that you're actually doing what you say you're doing? And then there's another long silence. And you know, my argument is, look, if you don't want to advance and hire women, that's your affair. I mean, some of it's going to be illegal. That's going to be your problem. But if you're not going to do it, stop saying this stuff because it makes you look like an idiot because you say one thing, you do something else. And you know, the thing, the problem here is everybody can see it. Everybody always knows. So if only from a perspective of brand consistency, you kind of need to get your ducks in a line. Margaret, there's another question here from Adrian. She asked, does Margaret think it will be harder or easier to create work cultures with better communication post pandemic? What specific steps can small business owners take? And what about larger business owners? Yeah, this is a huge unknown. It's so interesting because there's clearly a whole group of people saying, Working from home is fantastic, love it to bits, never want to go back. This is the shape of things to come. And there's another group of people saying, mm, yeah, it kind of has its advantages. It also has some downsides. Um, I'm not so sure about it. Um, the people in the first camp generally include all the finance people because they understand if they can get rid of all the real estate, they really change the financial model of their business. So some of this is genuine and some of it is driven by a very different agenda. So I think the jury is completely out on this. I would say as someone who has always done a lot of work from home um, in the last 20 years, I'm very accustomed to it. Doing it exclusively, I find unbelievably tedious. And there are a lot of small things that take a ridiculous amount of effort that take 25 emails that would take a three minute conversation. And there's a huge amount of motivation that gets lost from remote and isolated working. And it's crucial that we remember that what really motivates people isn't money and it isn't goals and targets and all that stuff. It's each other. People are energized by each other. And it kind of works online, but it doesn't completely work online. 
So my recommendation to companies is actually use this time when everybody is at home and is equipped to work online. And as people start re-entering into work, do some different experiments. Think about, well, would, we li would you like to work uh, three days in the office or two days in the office or how flexible can we make this? Or is it really good for some things like meetings? And is it better to do kind of more thoughtful work from home? So mix it up a bit. I mean, different people will have different preferences, different industries will have different needs. But I don't think it's going to come out, because it almost never does, it's, all, it's going to come out on one side or the other, absolutely. I think there are going to be appropriate mixtures and hybrids for different people, different industries, and different moments. And I also think that we're all learning a lot about managing remotely. And I think we should keep at that. I mean, some of the innovations I'm seeing um, in terms of things like a 30-minute meeting with everybody every morning for half an hour, lots of companies are saying to me, you know, I don't know why we didn't do this when we were all in the office. And when we are all in the office, I want to keep doing it because it's just a great energizing way for everybody to start the day on the same page. So experiment, try stuff, don't think it's all one thing or the other, and talk to people about what they're finding in themselves, which they would not necessarily have predicted. Thank you. We have another question. Why do women business leaders often appear so strident? How do you get attention while staying true to yourself? Well, first of all, I'd say, do they? You sure? Or is it just that you expect women leaders to articulate their authority in a different way? One of the difficulties that female CEOs experience is that people have very, uh, a very broad range of ex expectations of them. So they expect them to be leaders, they expect them to be mothers, they expect them to be sisters, they expect them to be wives. In a way, you know, these are a whole panoply of expectations which male leaders generally don't have. Um, so if you expect your female CEO to be a bit like a mum to you, um, then obviously any behavior that isn't like that is gonna feel very strident. So, so there's a complex interplay here between what are people's expectations and then what is their experience and interpretation of what they see. I would have to say that um, I think women are often criticized for being strident when actually they're simply being assertive. That there are moments in leadership where you have got to be assertive. And if that's misinterpreted, that's unfortunate, but there are moments where being assertive is essential. I would also say that um, we, and we've seen, and we talked about this earlier, we've seen some outstanding examples of leadership in political leaders around the world recently. And I think what's really interesting is I would say that this second generation of female leadership, these women are actually much more comfortable being more empathetic. So if you think, for example, of early examples, so Margaret Thatcher, Golda Meir, um, these are pretty tough, macho women. And to call them strident would be an understatement. And I think they were like that because they'd had to fight so darn hard to get to the top. And I think we still see that a bit, you know, when you actually fought every inch of the way, there's a lot of uh, warmth and human kindness that may have got dissipated along the way. But what I'm seeing with this second generation of female leaders is they're less prepared to sacrifice their natural way of being to conform to a, a male norm. And they appreciate that a more empathetic form of leadership is actually more powerful. And so they're achieving what they're achieving in terms of high levels of trust by being themselves and not trying to fit into what I think is already, frankly, an, a fading stereotype for men and women alike.
Thank you for that, Margaret. Uh, we have another question. What would you add to your book now? <laughs> Um, well, it's interesting, actually, <laughs> because, you know, as you mentioned, it came out in the UK in February and the paperback comes out in, um, I think, at the end of the year. And my editor has already asked me to write a postscript. Um, so these things never stop. Right? And I just finished you know, doing a new edition of Willful Blindness. So it's like, oh, my God, no sooner have I finished a book than I end up um, updating it because they always seem to be incredibly timely. Um, I think what I would probably add is something that I said earlier. Um, well, I would add two things. One is I would add what I said earlier about this idea that there is such a thing as the science, you know, that it's just a kind of absolute incontrovertible truth that we need to understand that, that science is a process of discovery because I think it's a, it's a real misunderstanding. But also, you know, there's a lot in my book about how uncertainty is what gives us freedom in life. If everything were certain and determined, we'd have no freedom and life would be dreary because it would just be a gigantic to-do list at the end of which is death. Right? And I think I might add that actually there's a really positive face to uncertainty. If you ask people, for example, do they know what they're getting for their birthday? 90% of people will say they don't want to know. They like the surprise. If you ask people, would they like to know in advance whether their marriage will end in success or failure? 90% of people will say, no, they don't want to know. They want the adventure. They want the experience. And I think this is just a great kind of demonstration of the degree to which uncertainty, as anxious as it can make us feel, is also what gives us freedom. It gives us choices and it gives us a sense of our power to influence our own experience of life. And I don't think anybody wants to give that up because that is freedom. Margaret, thank you so much. Before we end, I want to just invite you to share any final thoughts that you have. Hmm. Well, I guess I would sort of reiterate what I just said. And I recognize that in this very difficult moment in the world's history and in America's history, I recognize that saying there's a positive side to uncertainty can feel like a bit of a tough ask. But I think the truth is that even at these difficult moments, we have choices which will define the future for us. We are never without choices. We are never without options. The future has not been written by anybody. So anybody who says, oh, it's inevitable that, or of course this is going to happen. These people are trying to steal from you your power to make the future that you want. And mm. please don't let them. You have human imagination, human creativity to create a human feature, future for you, for the people you love. Don't give it away.